Let me tell you what's worse than building the first $100,000, and that is paying off over $110,000 in total debt. And I did so many stupid things with my money in my 20s, but I don't have a time machine to change all that, right? But this video is not about how I paid off my debt, but how long it took me to build my first $100,000 after I became debt free. And at the beginning stage of my financial independence journey, also known as the FIRE movement, I had several psychological barriers I had to overcome. Being debt free is awesome, but I was also afraid of going back into debt again or losing my money in investments because quite frankly, I didn't know what I was doing in the stock market. And I'm sure many of you guys and gals watching this can relate. And I was constantly asking myself if I should first invest in a Roth IRA or 401k and what index funds I should choose to invest in. And should I build up my emergency fund before I start investing or do it at the same time? So saving the first $10,000 was actually pretty easy after I became debt free, but getting to the first $100,000 took me years to get there. But here's the weird thing. Going from $100,000 to $1 million is a lot faster than going from zero to $100,000 because of the snowball effect. And throughout this video, I'm not going to include any home equity in any calculations. There's just going to be savings and investments. Let me show you this. The late legendary investor, Charlie Munger, who recently passed away in November, said that the first $100,000 is the most important part of the journey to building your wealth, but it is by far the hardest part of your financial journey. He said the first $100,000 is a bush, <laughs> but you got to do it. He didn't say bush, but I think you get the meaning. All right. He further said, I don't care what you have to do, even if it means walking everywhere and not eating anything that wasn't purchased with a coupon find a way to get your hands on $100,000. And he said this in the mid 1990s. So let me show you what I did to get from 1000 in my rainy day fund to $100,000 in my savings and investments. Trust me, I, I just didn't understand anything about the stock market back in 2016. I really didn't. And the first time I ever bought anything in the stock market was this one, Vanguard S&P 500 ETF. But I still didn't fully understand what it did and this is not by any means giving you financial advice saying that this is what you need to buy okay i remember that it was like 180 bucks when i bought it but the very next day it went down to 178 just like this chart today this is from today's stock market right it's trading at 462 and this was back in 2016. i was like man i bought this stock at 180 today and then the very next day it went down to 178 and i was like man what the heck man i was i was like did the price go down because i bought it i really had no idea what i was doing so it took me many more days and weeks uh, studying the s p 500 like what it was what it did and why the stock market changed or prices changed all the time and many brand new investors become hesitant when the market drops one percent in a day or maybe even five percent in a week this is a barrier I had to break with time because all I could see at the time was what the stocks were doing throughout the day or throughout the week. And in order to get past this fear of losing money in the stock market, it helped me understand better by just simply doing this, by zooming out. That's it. All right. And looking at the long term, right? If I left my money where it was from 2017 and to 2020, right here. Okay, and did not contribute any more money to the ETF. I would have actually lost money in three years without any, let's assume that no dividend reinvestments. But I learned to consistently invest by dollar cost averaging my investment. So I start buying my ETF at 180, 178, 185, 190, and so on and so forth. And every time I invest, I'm looking at how much my investments will grow in 10 or 20 years, not six months to a year. The market will always go up and down, up and down. If you only pay attention to weeks, months, or even a few years, just think about the financial crisis in 2008. If you knew what you know now, would you go back in time to invest more money in 2008 and 2009? How about 2020 during COVID? Or how about as recently as 2022, right? During the bear market, this share price is at 462 right now. And it was 180 way back in 2016. So think about that. 
okay? And here's another factor you should be aware of, and that's paralysis by analysis. And this is a really funny picture because I can definitely relate to this. Let me know in the comment section down below if you feel the same. You can uh, also schedule a first session with me for free by visiting firesetcher.com slash coaching. But anyway, when I wasn't very smart with investing, I started reading books about the stock market and follow what millionaires and billionaires did to get to that status. I wasn't as obsessed with becoming a millionaire. I just wanted to become financially solvent so that I never have to worry about going back into debt again or not being able to pay for something I want, like going on a vacation. I also wanted to have the possibility to retire early. But when I started to consume this enormous amount of inf information from CNBC, The Wall Street Journal, books, podcasts, and other news articles about a stock market crash next week, a possible recession later this year, or how the dollar is going to collapse in five years. It would give me analysis paralysis to act on buying stocks or other assets because I was overthinking about what the market will do today, tomorrow, this year, or next year. I just became frozen. So to overcome this, I really focused on the fundamental analysis of the stocks, ETFs, and other index funds I wanted to purchase. And Warren Buffett said that you should never invest in something you don't understand. And I've been following that principle ever since. That includes the S&P 500. When I invest in a business, I believe in the business fundamentals. If I invest in Apple, I want to believe in Apple's business fundamentals. I believe in the CEO of that company, and I believe that the company is becoming profitable or going to be even more profitable. When I invest in an index fund, I believe in long-term growth. I have a strategy that suits my age, risk tolerance, and my financial goals. My financial situation is entirely different from yours, so it will be unfair of me to say that my strategy will work for everyone, right? If you ever hear any YouTubers or anyone say that you should just invest how they invest, I want you to run as far away from that person as possible, right? And I, I would never do that to you on this channel, ever. Right. And here's how I got started with saving for my first $100,000. I divided my assets into five separate brackets, my cash reserve, tax deferred, Roth, healthcare, and after tax investments. My employer match was all going into the tax deferred account in my 401k or what's also known as the traditional 401k. My Roth IRA and Roth 401k were all going to be tax free. So they all went into my Roth bucket. My HSA or health savings account was a part of the healthcare bucket and everything else like real estate and taxable brokerage accounts were all in my after tax bucket. Cash reserve is the most important bucket out of all the buckets because this is what prevented me from going back into debt again. I don't want to have too much retirement, too much real estate or too much cash because having too much cash, I could lose that to inflation, right? I wanted to have a balance between these five buckets. And if I had to take a 401k loan or a HELOC, that means I'm not saving enough cash on the side. And like I said, the short-term goal for me was to save and invest my first $100,000, whatever it took. Don't just keep planning and planning to save your first $100,000. I want you to just start doing it and then tweak the plan as you go. It doesn't have to be perfect at all, or you're going to be stuck in paralysis by analysis, right? So what do you think is better? Investing 500 bucks a month, making 10% return, or investing $1,000 a month, making a 7% return on investment? You can't figure out how much you can invest without a budget. There's no way around it. I personally tested out the budgeting app called YNAB, and it's not just an app that can track your income and expenses, but it can even help you create a plan to pay down your student loans, car loans, personal loans, or credit cards a lot faster. So if you're ready to change your life by getting out of the paycheck to paycheck cycle, you can get a free trial without any credit card information by using the link in the description below. And delayed gratification is something I worked on when I was on my debt-free journey. And I spent two whole years paying off my stupid debt from credit cards, car loans, and personal loans to my 401k loan. I didn't save or invest because I had to focus everything on my debt. And I bit way more than I could chew. So I made a promise to myself that I would never put myself into that kind of situation ever again. Once I became debt free, I was already mentally and psychologically ready to make short term financial sacrifices. I didn't buy a brand new car. I didn't buy fancy clothes. 
I've been wearing this same shirt for, I don't know, the last three years, maybe five years. I didn't buy a house I couldn't afford. And I'm, I'm gonna get a lot of flax on this statement in the comment section, but you know, I was okay with renting because paying rent was way better than paying 45% of my income towards the mortgage. And that's called being house poor. I didn't wanna be house poor and buying a house was not my main objective, but saving that first $100,000 was my primary goal. You could argue with me and say that home equity is one of the fastest ways to grow your wealth, which I won't disagree with you on, but I can't gain access to the equity in my home unless I took out a home equity loan, a HELOC, or just sell it, right? Taking out a loan against my home is way too risky anyway. And that's one of the things I promised myself that I would never do. My primary home is always gonna be an expense of mine, not an investment. My rental properties, on the other hand, are considered investments because renters are paying for the mortgage. That's the main difference between a primary home and an investment home. Here's how I built my first $100,000 worth my investing timeline in 2016. So between January and May of 2016, I spent five months working on my cash reserve because that was the buffer I wanted to have before I ever went back into debt again. This is the common mistake that people make is that I'm just gonna keep investing and not have a lot of cash. Then you become cash poor. Right? You want to have that balance between those two. So starting in January, I only had $1,200 in my rainy day fund, or now my emergency fund, but I had zero debt. So my goal was to have $20,000 set aside in my emergency fund in five months, just in case I ever became unemployed. Again, this was the first step I needed to accomplish to prevent me from going back into debt. And I did everything I could to set aside cash and put it in my high yield savings account or HYSA. So I didn't start investing at all other than my 401k match until I reached $20,000, which cover about six months of my expenses at the time back in 2016. Then the next step was to take a look at my 401k plan. My employer at the time offered a 4% employer contribution or employer match if I contributed 8%. So that was the bare minimum I contributed to my Vanguard Roth 401k at the time because I got a 100% guarantee return from my employer by making that 8% contribution. So between my employer and I, I was already saving 12% of my income to my 401k, but 4% of that was free from my employer. That makes sense so far, right? And so by May, 2016, I had a fully funded emergency fund with six months of expenses set aside and a little bit of 401k invested. The next step I took was to max out my Roth IRA contribution. I didn't just do the bare minimum with my Roth IRA. I went to the maximum contribution of 5,500 in the year 2016. That was about $920 a month to my Roth IRA because I didn't start contributing until June, right? But I was done with my emergency fund here. So I had room in my budget to do the Roth IRA. And I was really bummed about this to miss out on the 2015 Roth IRA because I didn't know at the time that the Roth IRA deadline wasn't until April 15th and not December 31st. So keep that in mind. You can only contribute to your 401k until December 31st, but you can contribute to your Roth IRA until April 15th of next year or whenever the tax deadline is. And I can never go back to contribute to the 2015 Roth IRA ever again, because I already missed out on it. And if you don't know where to start, just remember to never miss out on your Roth IRA contribution. So let me show you this. This is my net worth statement from September, 2016, not counting my home equity, all right? I had a total of 50,000 right here, $276.87. That is the total assets I have. I do a net worth update every September because that's my birthday month. And I had a total of $24,500 in cash, but $20,000 of that was in my emergency fund. And I had a total of $19,225 between my 401k and Roth IRA. This was also thanks to the stock market when it performed a 10% return that year in 2016. You have to do your net worth statement to find out where you are. And you can download all of these resources for absolutely free by visiting fireseachet.com resources. And then in 2017, I started a 
brand new investment timeline just for that year, okay? The Roth IRA contribution limit for 2017 was still $5,500. So I budgeted for $459 a month for my Roth IRA. But because I didn't have any debt and my emergency fund was fully funded, I still have room to invest in my 401k. So the next step was to contribute more to my Roth 401k. And instead of thinking about what percentage I wanted to contribute, I started thinking about the maximum 401k contribution, which was $18,000 as an employee way back in 2017. And my employer contributed another $5,000 with the 4% match, like I said earlier. But here's something else I discovered about the 401k. I wasn't just limited to $18,000. My maximum limit was actually $54,000 in 2017. You know what the limit is in 2024? It's $69,000, not including the catch-up contribution. My employer gave me a $5,000 in match. So if I subtract $18,000 and $5,000 by $54,000, I had $31,000 in after-tax contribution left in my 401k. Remember, the after-tax portion is completely separate from the Roth portion inside my 401k. And this was what's called a mega backdoor Roth offered by my employer and Vanguard so I could have a Roth 401k contribution of $18,000 and an after-tax 401k contribution of $31,000. So my goal that year was to completely max out my 401k at 54K, right? My portion was $49,000, right? So if I divided by 26 pay periods, I got paid every two weeks at the time, that was about $1,900 every two weeks that went to my 401k. And that $31,000 was rolled right over to the Roth IRA or what's called an in-service withdrawals to my Roth IRA. This is a very complicated process that took me quite some time to learn. So if you're still confused about this, just type in a mega backdoor Roth and fireside chat on the YouTube search page where I explain this in detail. In 2024, like I said, your total 401k contribution limit is actually $69,000. Remember that the employee portion is $23,000 for 2024. The rest of it is either from your employer or from you if your 401k allows you to make the after-tax contribution. That makes sense so far, right? If not, just schedule a session with me by visiting fireside.com slash coaching. And the market did really well in 2017. And I mean, really well. It was well over 20% return in 2017 just from the S&P 500. I didn't know what I was doing, right? Not that well, but I was only investing in the S&P 500. Not personalized financial advice, but that's just what I did. Only that one ETF. Again, I'm not including any home equity in this calculation. My total savings and investments were almost $150,000. I reached my $100,000 goal by August because I was already saving about 50% of my total income. But was this a sustainable lifestyle? I didn't think so because I didn't have that balance of investing my money and enjoying my life by going on vacations. So I had to take a step back a little bit. And I'm like, you know what? This is great. I can max out my 401k. You know, I could just stay home and eat nothing, right? My daughter was four at the time. And so in the following year, in 2018, I wanted to take a step back from investing so much and I actually start to set some money aside so that I could take my daughter on vacations. So we went on a Disney cruise in 2018 and it was an absolute blast because, you know, I paid cash for it. And I started to set more money aside to travel to all kinds of different places. I don't care to purchase any materials. Let me know in the comment section down below if you feel the same way. But I, I truly enjoy splurging on experiences, like when we went to Austria and Germany last year. So take a look at the compound interest calculator when you start with just $1,000. Just by saving 25% of my income in 2016 and then 50% of my income in 2017, allowed me to get to $100,000 in about two and a half years. Is that realistic for everyone? Of course not, right? It's not realistic for everyone because of income. And I'm on the, this fire journey and I'm fired up to save as much money as I could back then because I, I wasted so much time paying off my debt and that's why I did it. But when you calculate how fast you can save your first $100,000, your savings rate still matters the most. If you're afraid of investing, you're not going to get to $100,000 by just sitting on the sidelines, just sitting on cash. If you have paralysis by analysis, you're not going to get to $100,000 by being indecisive. If you can't practice delayed gratification, 
you're not gonna have enough room in your budget to set aside for your savings. So let's say you make, let's do the realistic numbers, okay? Because I know some of you guys will complain in the comment section. So let's do $70,000 a year, which is the median income for the US. So if you just set aside 15% of your gross income, not your, not your take home, your gross income, that would be $10,500, okay? Check this out, check the numbers on the right, okay? All right, how long does that take you? Hmm, about year six, right there. Not even, about five and a half years by setting aside 15% of your income between 2016 and 2021 to get to $100,000 in total savings and investments. And what if you're just starting now, let's say with an 8% average annual return, okay? Let me go ahead and delete that. Let's start from here, 2024. And I'm just gonna do the same thing, all right? 15% of your income, gross income, look at that number. So with an 8% average annual return, it would take you seven years to get to that $100,000. How incredible is that, right? Look, I know some of you guys will say in the comment section that inflation is too high and it's hard for you to save right now. I completely get the times can be very tough, especially right now. But if you tell me that it is impossible, I don't know what else to tell you. This is coming from an immigrant who came to this country with no money. This is coming from someone who never went to a four-year college, but got an online undergrad degree with a bunch of professional certificates at 34 years old. That's right, I didn't get my four-year degree until I was 34. And this is coming from someone who once had over $47,000 in credit card debt, $38,000 in car loans, $15,000 in a 401k loan, and $10,000 in a personal loan I took out from a divorce. Was that the default? No, it was a contributing factor, but that wasn't it. I took it out, but nothing is impossible. You have to either overcome these obstacles or you just remain stuck. The choice is yours.